what we got here is a model 659 Starrett indicator stand so that's pretty cool I like this it's gonna be one of those things that I'm gonna I don't know I'm gonna have to really give some serious thought about whether or not I want to let this one go well so I just went and looked at my other big monster Starrett stand that I have the uh, it's all practically brand new in the original case and it's a different style than this so uh, I was hoping it was the same as this then I could sell the one that's practically brand new in the case which is worth more money because of the condition and keep this one for myself but nope so I guess this one will go on the go on the keep shelf for the time being yeah so we'll let this uh this will let this indicator go down the road what I like is it's a standard gauge down here but uh actually up here in the corner in this red it actually says Pratt and Whitney let's get to this first uh, this pile just because uh, this is a uh, Lufkin radius gauge set in S77CX uh, he had 15 on it so um, you know it's got the original Lufkin case the case isn't broken and it's complete and it's got the uh, little handle so it's a nice radius gauge set uh, being that it's a Lufkin, it's not going to bring as much money as a Starrett. And even the Starrett radius gauge sets, I don't get big money for them because they, they just aren't, uh, you know, it's just not as popular an item as many of the other things. But, you know, hey, we'll get some of this money back. Oh, I started to say maybe I make enough back off the rest of this stuff to justify hoarding, hoarding that... Uh, that indicator base. He had a stack of little uh, these quick reference booklets there. He was giving these out for free. He was just asking, you know, a guy came by and asked. It. He said, "Oh, they're free." He said, "But just, just you know, don't take them all." Um, so I had spotted this earlier when I looked through the pile, and then when he made that announcement, they were free. I I went back in the pile and snagged this Morse to go with my group that I bought from him here always feel better about taking freebies when I have purchased something even though that wasn't he didn't think that was necessary he would have gladly given me this even if I didn't make any purchases I've got a few of these I keep like one in each toolbox uh, around the, around here and there so they're quick references they're they're nice and handy to have I snagged this um, this head this is Interestingly enough, this one is clearly marked Starrett. Uh, this is probably a centering head for a 6-inch scale, which he did not have. Um, but I think he threw this in with, the, with everything when I inquired about it. I think you know, we made that, made that part of the deal. And I think because he didn't know the whereabouts of the scale, he was happy to include this. But I really wish he had the scale. It would have been, that would have been a sweet find. These little... These little stare at six inch scales with the combination if you have the the um, the 90 degree head and the centering head on them they uh, they bring pretty decent money in this little box right here this marked stare at attachment this is a uh, number 711 it says 711 EA one only and what's in here well it's just a bunch of mystery crap. I didn't look this up yet, actually. Now that I think of it. So there is a uh, well. There's a point for an, an indicator. Got a little bit of rust there. Threads look good though. And this end, the business end's good. So that's all that matters. But then there's these. So let's see if we can figure out what those are. Okay. Uh, looks like some of the mystery is solved here. So I probably should have recognized the uh, 7-Eleven number. Um, Serret Last Word Indicators, of course, very popular indicator series. There were, I guess, some different variations in there, so I think they have a couple different model numbers. <clears throat> but one of the Last Word Indicators was the 711 series, so I happen to have, uh, this is the last, last word that I, I sold off all of my Last Word Indicators that I had for surplus. I kept one for myself. This is the 711 FSZ. The F FS is probably full set or something like that. Um, so what's in here? 
the full set is or what's supposed to be in here for the full set. I don't know if it's actually missing anything. It looks like it is. Okay, so we've got the 7-Eleven. Uh, we've got this doohickey here. We've got this piece here. Okay, and then this is actually well, it's stuck in there, but this comes out of here. All right, and then what goes here is probably the piece that's missing from there. So the interesting thing about this is if you google this right here the 711 EA um, somebody on eBay is has got the newer style box and what's in it is one of these so they're assuming that this is the 711 uh, I don't even think these this part has a part number on it yeah this is just simply marked stare it I have two of them so these are just simply marked stare it this piece comes out Urgh. Okay. In fact, it appears what actually is supposed to be in here is this piece. So the more common thing that comes up, and if you go to a website selling new Starrett, uh, they show this as the 7-Eleven EA. On page 730 of my catalog, it has the, uh, supposedly it has the attachments for the 7-Eleven series last word indicator. And 7-Eleven EA is that piece right there. There's that other piece that I have right there. The interesting thing is I don't see that other holder. Now why it's not on this page, I don't know. But if I go back to where the 7-Eleven indicators are on the, in the book, it shows that piece. That's called the 7-Eleven Universal Shank. See the 7-Eleven FS I think is, is the indicator with that. Maybe. Same thing over here. 7-Eleven LS with universal friction holder and universal shank. So the universal friction holder is the 7-Eleven EA, that piece right there. So what's the part number of that sucker? Universal shank. Oh, okay, finally, in, finally found the 7-Eleven F is the shank alone. And the uh, and then it also says part number seventy one oh three a, so I guess to help differentiate because then there's a seven eleven f is also a gooseneck shank, which is seventy one oh seven a. Go figure. That isn't confusing enough. Ha! Huh. And then over here it describes the sets, and uh, the funny thing is that this seven eleven f s z that I have right here is actually the part number for the indicator without shank and case. If you have this in the case with it, it becomes a 711 FSBZ and if you have I'm sorry, uh AZ and if you have it with the gooseneck shank, uh it's an FSBZ. Huh. So this set's not really, it, this set's actually not supposed to have this in there, <laughs> is what it comes down to. So, go, go figure. I'm sorry, I'm bogging down the process here with all of this minutia. So this is a 7-Eleven incomplete because it's missing that piece, unfortunately. None of that tells us anything about, well, we know what this is. This is an indicator point, okay? None of us explains to us what this is. Oh, wait a minute, we got numbers right on here. You moron. This is 448-8, and this is a 448-3, which tells me these were probably part of a set with a part number 448, but I have no idea what they are. There's a tiny logo on there. I can barely make out the letters on it. It's a little diamond shaped logo with three letters in it. Boy, sometimes eBay comes through for you. You know, if you just put in 448 space 8 in Google, there's so many things will come up that it's pretty useless, but there's a little trick I learned. Oh, shut up, Google. Here's a little trick I learned, which is uh, put the 448-8 in on eBay search and then narrow the search using the category 
and narrow the category to machinist uh, items, you know, under business and, and industrial. And then, of course, I sort by low to high because that can't be too expensive. And there it is right there. And so the letters that I can't quite make out for sure are ITI. And this is an ITI tungsten carbide tooling and checking. It says construction ball, 0.5 inch diameter. So now I can go back in here and I can put in um, ITI 448. And actually still that only that lonely one comes up. Tooling balls, checking balls, construction balls available in 440C stainless steel. Oh, okay. So maybe 448 ITI ball. This is funny. They actually have a website, itiball.com. Talk about a company that makes something specialized in nothing else. ITI, tooling and checking balls. ITI manufactures and stocks two standard types of tooling balls. The type 224 tooling balls and the type 448 checking balls. Available singly or in any quantities in diameters of quarter inch through one inch in one eighth inch increments. Balls and shanks are made of 440C stainless steel hardened to 58 to 55 to 58 uh, RC. It must be Rockwell. And are also available in tungsten carbide. Oh, so that, that might be a tungsten carbide the guy has on eBay. I don't know. Assemble in proprietary technique. Yada, yada, yada. So I'll have to put these with my miscellaneous gauges. I got a little section where I stick all of my orphan gauge blocks and whatnot. One last look up close for the morbidly curious. Next up, he had this uh, brown and sharp micrometer. Um, he had eight bucks on it, so I figured I was going to be able to get it for like five or six bucks. And at first, I was going to just pass on it because it didn't look very interesting to me, but then I noticed that it was a, uh, a Model 1011. So what this has got is... Uh, well, what it's got is a lock that actually still works, believe it or not. But it's a tenths micrometer. It's 599-1011. Uh, brown and sharp convertible thimble micrometer. Oh, that's nice. And here we've got a nice brown and sharp standard still in the uh, still in the anti-corrosive paper. And yet it's still got some flex of corrosion on it. Oh, yeah, there you go. That did a good job, really. Maybe, oh, I spoke too soon. This isn't the anti-corrosive paper. This is the, uh, this is the positive corrosion, corrosion paper. So we got a nice little uh, standard with some rust on it. Although there's like enough clean around the edge there that you can still use it. Let's, let's, not, get all, let's not get too upset, guys, right? All right, out loud. What do you want for flipping... Eight dollar micrometer, no less than that, really, right? Unfortunately, Brown and Sharp decided to use the same number again later on, I guess, in their history uh, after Tessa acquired them, and they used the five ninety nine dash ten eleven prefixes for the series of attachments or probes for one of their uh, like height master type uh, gauges or something. So you get a bunch of this. I think I may have figured out why they call this a convertible thimble micrometer. I just stumbled upon something when I was playing around with this friction lock. Uh, I'm sorry, the friction thimble. So this is the lock. This is the friction style thimble, not unlike some of the sterets. And the way this works is it provides a light amount of drag so that when you come up on what you're measuring, this will start to slip. It's got a positive lock in the reverse. So, in other words, the way it's designed is when I turn this back, it's it's locking up positively to this. But when I turn in this way, it's got this ability to slip. Okay, nothing unusual about that, except... This micrometer has something I've never seen in a micrometer before, which is this outer collar. If we turn this outer collar in, what it does is it positively locks this to this in both directions. Wow. 
Why you would want to be able to do this, I have no idea. But I think that's what they mean by convertible thimble. This is one way, and then you put it out, and it becomes a different way. Anyways, that's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Next item here is uh, quite a nice little find. It's a Brown and Sharp uh, 654 center gauge attachment. 599-654 is the full Brown and Sharp part number. It's kind of funny how big this box is. At first glance, you might think that this was just thrown in a Brown and Sharp box. But no, this in fact is the center gauge attachment. What this thing is, is it's got a slot in it with a little spring steel piece in there. And then it's got almost like a V-block on the back side of it. Okay, so there's the end profile. And what this little slice of heaven is, is uh, this is actually a uh, uh, fishtail. This is a Starrett fishtail. I don't have the brown and sharp one. I had one, but I sold it uh, a while back. Well, we're just going to use the Starrett one. We're going to put Starrett and brown and sharp together just for the purposes of this demonstration, but I caution you at doing such a such a travesty on your own <laughs> so now what this does is this allows you to take your fishtail and keep it in perfect alignment to the uh, to whatever it is you've got chucked up in your lathe so previously if you were using this to align your your cutter all right you would just hold this like this right and you were relying on that you weren't inadvertently tipping this a little bit, which would cause you to possibly get some error in there. So by having this little uh, this little doohickey, all right, just make sure it's fully seated. And then we come up, and now that little V is going to keep that V groove is going to keep this in perfect alignment on this. All right. So kind of neat, neat little attachment. Um, Unfortunately, I I don't think I'm going to keep it. I'm going to um, I'm going to probably just sell that just so I can recoup some of the money I spent on this lot. I know there's some guys that really like brown and sharp stuff. They collect it. I know I I got I forgot how much I got for just the fishtail alone when I had it way back when. But I'm sure whoever bought that would probably love to have that attachment. And quite frankly, I don't use the fishtails that often, anyways. I've got the uh, Loris holders, so I can set the height and pretty much keep it, keep them dialed in. At least that's the theory. So anyway, so there's that. And then the last out of this group is this um, Brown and Sharp surface gauge, which I kind of, you know, I always joke about. Oh, I got to stop buying these surface gauges. Which I just picked up another one yesterday, but that's in an upcoming. That's, that's down the road. Anyways, this one, though, what's cool about this one, besides the fact that it's rusted tight and doesn't want to give up, yeah, that's going to need a little attention. First thing you might notice is it's kind of thick, and the reason why is because this is a magnetic one, okay? So we flip the lever, and she's magnetic. Apparently it's on. Well, maybe not. Let's see. Oh, now that's, that's on. Oh, that's definitely on. Oh, that's a good magnet in there. And that's off. Okay, cool. So that's good that that's working. Uh, so really, it looks like we'll just have to take apart this assembly here, free this up, and that'll be, uh, that'll be all right. And then... This is the clamping nut on here. I don't know if that's an original brown and sharp or not. Probably is, though. So the only other travesty with this thing is that it has what I can only describe as a Lego-like gear <laughs> that has been installed on here to replace what I can only imagine was a nice little fine thumb wheel atta uh, adjustment that went in here. I'm wondering what the second hole is for. Is that for... Huh. I wonder why they have a second threaded hole up here. Closer to the fulcrum. Alright, so I 
look through my bag of tricks here and uh, I found uh, this. It's got the little plastic handle on it there. So it's not ideal, but it threads in there. I did find this one. I got excited there because it's metal and it's more like what was originally in here based on the photographs I've looked at. Would have been the perfect solution except the, uh, the threads are different. It won't screw in. I don't know what the heck the threads are on there. Might even be metric. This one works out fine. So, not ideal from an original perspective. But this is tilting. It's working like it should. Um, certainly an improvement in looks over this thing. <laughs> oh, so um, there's no part number on here. Uh, like on previous ones that I've had. Uh, brown and sharp surface gauges. So this might be a really early version, but I believe this is a 7743, model 7743. The newer version of the 7743 has a, uh, a placard here that has the, the word on on it, to, so you know which direction to turn this to turn it on and off. And it doesn't have all of this mumbo jumbo over here on this side with the patents, patent numbers and everything. So anyways, so like I said, the only thing this needs now, a little bit more cleanup maybe, but uh, really the only thing it needs now is for this sleeve right here to be taken care of. What happens with these is when they rust, this inner piece does not slide in this sleeve. So what's supposed to happen right now is that's supposed to be able to, that outer sleeve should be able to move that way far enough to allow this to not be clamped in there anymore so that I can slide this out and adjust it and it's locked up. So I'm just going to see if I can take care of that right now because, uh, I don't know, I think I'm going to put this up for sale. I don't have a magnetic one like this though. And I do have a cast iron surface plate, but I don't know, I just can't think of many times where I just am going to need that specific application and because it's brown and sharp and there are guys who like the brown and sharp a lot might might be willing to I don't know probably sell this thing for like 30 bucks I hope <laughs> I had a nice guy come by the shop I think it was last week picked up a couple of things I had for sale one or two items and uh, he spotted my bench block and uh, he commented, he asked me whether or not I was the guy who had one of these up for sale on uh, like Craigslist for Ever or Marketplace and was asking a ton of money for it. And he said, I don't, I, you know, I said, no, it's not me. And he says, I don't get it. And I, I said, well, this one is a uh, it's marked made in India, so it's a cheapo one. But I, I, I said, you know, Starrett and I think Brown and Sharp both had their own versions of these. And if it's a genuine Starrett or a genuine Brown and Sharp, they actually trade for pretty decent money. And he he asked, he said, what's the point of one of these things? So I was kind of at a loss to, like, just explain it in words, but it's kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, okay, you want to knock a pin out or something, you need... It, it's just a handy thing. Case in point, perfect application right here, okay? I want to drive this inner sleeve. I want to try and move that inner sleeve while holding this outer sleeve. There's a bevel right here. So this diameter right here is part of this part that I want to move. This beveled section right here, okay, or taper, this is part of this outer sleeve that I want not to move so that I can try and get them to separate from each other. So bench block here is going to be the perfect tool for this. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to push this out that way and we don't want to bend this threaded rod so let's just tighten the tap lightly. There we go. All right. And again bench block worked out perfectly. That hole right there was the perfect diameter to support, to allow this to stick down in there, but still support this little narrow edge right here. Now that I've got the rod out, I should be able to actually get this to go out even further. And the idea is if we can get it completely apart, clean the rust off of it, then it'll work. It'll work like 
Brown and Sharp intended it to originally. There we go. And there's your problem right there. You can see it, the rust. Voila. So we'll clean that up. And no, I'm not tightening the jaws of the drill chuck on the threads. I'm on that other part. I already cleaned it up some, but it's going to get a little... That looks like the thing might be bent a little bit. That's just because of the way I'm, I'm holding it in the drill chuck from that non-round piece. Nice and clean. Now, if I can clean that bore, that would be... That would be good. So ideally I would take a small wooden dowel and I would uh, cut a little slot in the end and uh, I would take a little strip of the emery cloth, bend the, the end of the strip, stick the end of the, uh, the bent end into the slot and then wrap it around. And then once you insert it into the bore you want to clean, it'll, it'll work just fine. And then you can chuck that, uh, you can put that wooden dowel into the uh, drill chuck and use the mechanic mechanical advantage but something like this lots of times I found I can just wrap the uh, wrap the stuff into a uh, into a little tube get it in there and then find just the right size drill that'll grab it oops make sure it's going forward otherwise it'll back out there we go I don't get to go hog wild and now that is clean as a whistle. I wonder what clean as a whistle means. Where does that come from? What is the what is the origin of that little chestnut? <laughs> clean as a whistle. I mean, think about a whistle. You blow into a whistle, right? And inevitably saliva and stuff's gonna be introduced into it. I mean, if if some sweaty referee handed you his whistle and said, hey, blow this, you know, you might, you might, you might, you know, think twice about it, right? Anyways, so that must be a reference to some other type of whistle, like a train whistle or something, maybe because all the steam blowing through it, hot steam blows through it and keeps it clean inside. I don't know. What the hell are you talking about, Steve? All right. Oh, so we're going to clean the inside of this sleeve. That's rusty too. Looks good. All right, so here it is all back together. And now it's working the way it should. That's locked. And we just give it a quick twist. And that allows us to swivel this. And also to move the rod in and out. And it's still a little crunchy and crispy because the rod's got some cleaning that it could use otherwise it's a pretty good shape i would say that's ready to go